Today I'm speaking with Emma Thorne. Emma, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to see you. And Emma is a YouTuber. Uh, I'll have her link beneath our video. Please go like and subscribe and hit the bell for her channel. It's uh, Emma Thorne Videos. But she's also a VFX editor by day and a YouTuber by night. And uh, you are in London, is that correct? That is correct, yes. yes. What's, what's it like? Are you actually like in the city? I'm I'm on the outskirts. I live in uh, I live in the nice bit by the forest where okay. it takes an hour to get anywhere, but it's less crazy. Yeah, I'll bet. What's it like living that close to London? Do you go into the city a lot and kind of explore the historical stuff and take in the arts? the last couple of years, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. We used to go in a lot. We're big. Um, my friends and I are big museum buffs. We're trying to get around all the museums in London. I think there's like 200 or something. So. Uh, it's a it's a task. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I grew up in uh, Phil near Philadelphia, right on the outskirts, and there's quite a few museums there, and it's it's always a delight to get to those and see some of the really really old artwork. Although old in America is very different from old in the UK and, and yes, Europe. Yes, true, true. I was just true. reading an article that they said a thousand year old pub was about to close in in, in England, and I thought you don't read about that in the US. <laughs> Nothing is a thousand years old. Yeah, um, yeah. I like seeing that. I like when it's like, this building is 60 years old or something. And you're like, man. <laughs> that's a oh, blink of the eye. Well, in terms nothing. of, yeah, nothing at all. In terms of your YouTube channel, I just want to do this for the rest of the bio and then I'll pass the floor to you. You focus on some very interesting topics. And again, everyone can go check you out. But I just want to make sure that I mention some of the more interesting ones that I've seen are you talk about people like... Um, Ken Ham with creationism and who is the most recent guy you've been kind of bantering with? Uh, Kent Hovind and I Kent have Hovind, a little, that's right. little back and forth online. Yeah, that's fun. I guess he, he you decided to whack you as an atheist. And mm -hmm. um, you also deal with the anti multi-level marketing stuff, trying to expose some of that, which is, I know other people have done a lot of that too. And it's just, it's so important. We see a lot of that here, I think in the Christian world with like essential oils and a few other products, but um, yeah. You talk about sexuality, obviously, and responding to Christian YouTubers about a bunch of topics, and you also deal with feminism. What are what would you say is your main thrust of your YouTube channel, and and, and is it going to change at all? Like, is there anything kind of brewing that's going to change in the next year? I think the kind of the the interest, the core interest that I have that ties it all together is this kind of almost consumer protection, but sort of. Uh, anything that is I've I find is deceiving people or harming people and that's the sort of underlying thread and they're all so connected like you just said about multi-level marketing tends to target like Christian groups and specifically Christian women and then uh, a lot of religious fundamentalists have certain teachings that are very anti-feminist and so it all kind of ties into this it's my focus is kind of just who is who has a, a big audience and a big platform and is teaching dangerous or false things with it um and i think in that respect it's probably going to continue much the same because i just find that so fascinating but because it's such a broad sort of spectrum of things um you know sometimes i end up talking about quite different things that i didn't expect to i did a recorded a video about video games today and how video games are evil and you shouldn't shouldn't play them if you want to be successful so it it goes in all weird directions you just never know interesting i was going to say in terms of the scammers one interesting topic I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective on someday is the whole um what would you call it prosperity gospel preachers the name and claim it theology like if 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 you're truly a believer in jesus he's going to make you rich and he's going to make you healthy and if you're not you just don't have enough faith and you know by the way i have a you know new new jet i'm trying to buy so please donate to my 20 million dollar jet fund but yeah, Jesus Jesus told me to buy a motorcycle is one I saw just the other day. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's amazing the the stuff there that and, and what's interesting too is that there's there are in the midst of all those scammers, there are some people that are truly like they're not scammers. They're truly, truly profound believers. They don't want to take anybody's money. They just want people to believe. And yet in some ways, some of those people are more I mean, not more, but just as dangerous in the sense that they have a political agenda, um, especially like the dominion theology side of it, where they truly want to take over America, if not the whole world for Christ. And some of that, mm -hmm. you know, they don't want your money, but they do want your, they do want your complete allegiance. And it's, it's an interesting dynamic there too. Well, I'm getting off topic there. I do want to bring it back to you. Before we go into your story, could you tell us anything 
interesting, any hobbies, interesting stories, anything interesting about you for the bio? Um, so I th- it's probably not actually that interesting, but something that came up um, when I was doing a collaboration a little while ago is that I've had, I've had a million customer service jobs um, and uh, I am totally socially awkward and absolutely awful at all of them. So um, there's some videos online where you can hear me being like, oh, and another job I had. And uh, my my worst moment of all jobs I think I've ever had is um, spilling a latte on a dog, um, oh. which was not it was not a hot drink and it was OK. But uh, I, I blame the dog for tripping me up. <laughs> so for customer service, that's like talking to people on the phone that are calling in with a problem? Uh, more like in-person customer service. A lot of food service jobs, okay. um, waitressing and cafes and just so I've got no balance. I've got no people skills, just terrible. But I've done a, I've done a bunch of them. <laughs> well, I, th- I think you've definitely hit your stride with the YouTube channel. That's that's definitely something I can see you excel at. And again, I'm, I'm jealous of your um, video effects uh, abilities. That's something I hope to get into at some point. Well, I did want to make sure I uh, gave you the floor soon here to just kind of talk about your story. Everybody's story is different, and I believe everybody's story has a lot of power and a lot of uh, energy and a lot of dynamics that are different from mine and everyone else's. So I just wanted to hear where you're coming from, and I know that you are an atheist, but I'd love to hear how you got there and where, sure. you, where you started from and how you got there. Totally. Um I think it's kind of, I always find this really interesting, um, especially talking to people from the U.S., because... It's such a different, we're a much more secular country, but we don't have any kind of separation of church and state. So we tend to grow up with the Church of England here, but uh, with more secular households. So I had, um, I grew up with my mum and she was very, she's the sort of person, I think she'd probably define herself as like spiritual, but not religious. Um, and she was just, whatever you want to do or believe you go for. So that was very nice. Um, but in school, we still, there were statues of Jesus on the front of the school. We had the vicar come in and we learned hymns and we, you know, got given little books of Psalms. And so it was a very kind of strange, there wasn't really, not until I got a lot older and we started studying religious education and getting exposed to books of different religions and things like that. It was very, this is, Church of England is, um, it's just sort of generic Henry VIII created it so that he could divorce his wives um but it's it's like a very um kind of traditional you know we stand in the old buildings and sing hymns but we don't really we don't really worry about that much or talk about that much um so we just had a lot of like sorry carry on no when you compare that to the American version that you talk about what percentage of people in America in England that grew up in the Church of England would you say would be similar to kind of the fundamentalist you know, aggressive, this is absolutely real. This is not mythology. This is not about a very low moral. Very low. low. Yeah. Um have you met some of them in England? I can't think off the top of my head. I've I've met a couple and uh, part of that is living in London because we um we get quite a lot of street preachers. Um okay. so and I've had as a result I've spoken on the phone to like a few sort of British uh fundamentalists um which is always really interesting because of that that difference. But it's a very it's a very like vocal minority, you know, it's a really, really small number. And even when you get that sort of crossover, there's things like I've talked about before, sort of news stories in the UK where religious parents in the UK are campaigning for, you know, not talking about pride and stuff like that. Even then the sort of religious convictions come into it in a very small way compared to um, like stuff like that in the States. It's, because everybody's exposed to how that more sort of secular environment even if they are quite fundamentalist they wouldn't be able to quote the bible the way that a fundamentalist from the u.s would you know it's um yeah it's quite weird it's quite weird and different they're more like a like just a a general moral background like i'm a christian meaning i i believe in being honest and not stealing and you know the golden rule you know that kind of stuff you know being helpful and loving and you know don't go to war unless you have to kind of stuff is it is it more along that lines or yeah definitely yeah okay. we've had you know if um so we've had a couple of uh fairly recent prime ministers who have been like oh we're a good christian nation nation and those values are what and th- they never uh, that's the only time they've ever mentioned their christianity and they're not even 100 percent sure what values they're talking about it's just the sort of idea that we all have just like you say the golden rule being nice to your neighbor and 
you know it's very like almost i want to say wishy-washy <laughs> yeah well, um, compared to the light. theology i grew up with yeah yeah so did you um, when you're growing up in that though did they include like actual invitations to say like this isn't just about growing up in the church of england like you have to you know believe or be confirmed or whatever how, like how do they describe the the kind of if, if you're really committed as a christian what would that have looked like growing up and did you do that it was that part of your life it wasn't really part of my life the um the kind of exposure i had to that was friends who were things like catholic i think because the majority of people were church of england again it was just very like i the, the for some reason the one teaching i've always remembered from the vicar that came to my primary school was that uh when jesus was a baby he cried because he was like a normal baby and that's the only thing that i've he- like retained in my head because it was very it's very sort of almost casual even though you know you, you you're a kid and you're like thinking about it and having these personal struggles like because you're thinking my soul depends on this but really the approach that everybody took was very yeah Jesus is real just love everybody that's it it wasn't you know I think um the one like occasion that I so I had so I had that kind of um you know like vague upbringing and it was like I just assume Jesus is real and all this stuff because they're just they're saying he is and they're saying these stories are fact so I'm not you don't have the mind to question it um and then I got sort of like like grumpy teenage years and I became like angry atheist like 13 year old Emma um and there was a there's a thing called girl guides i don't know if you have them in the us i don't think it's kind of like scouts. So. okay it's basically basically scouts um but <laughs> i think it's better now when i was doing it you it was for girls and you mostly did like sewing and washing up um <laughs> and uh you had to it was all very religious then it's changed a lot now like more recent years they're kind of starting to make it more secular but you had to um you know swear your allegiance to god to be able to become a member and mm. i remember as a kid being like actually i i just quit <laughs> i really don't want to do this i don't want to say it and i just i just dipped out and my yeah. friends were kind of like yeah nobody believes it. everybody just says it and i just thought why do we do that though what's i don't understand the benefit why are we sort of perpetuating this and i just yeah i find the religion in the uk very very strange because it is just like this it's almost i think we're more precious about our traditions than we are about the actual religious aspect of it i think we're very a a traditional country and we love our our traditions and just going to church and stuff like that is part of the traditions and it's not necessarily Mm. believe this or that to the letter that's a great point i I wondered that a lot is how many people it's it's just doing something different sounds scary so let's just do what we've always Mm -hmm. done and it's you do get that sense with some people that they're not they're not really grounded in why they believe what they believe they just mm-hmm. know that everybody else seems kind of strange, you know, whether you're looking at, um, I mean, I guess London's probably more multicultural, so you probably see more differences there. But for a lot of people that I grew up with, you know, you just 95% of the people that you saw in your daily life, maybe even 100% were white, and they mostly went to a Protestant church, and they mostly all confessed Jesus as Lord, and anything else was like, you almost never even saw it. And then you just kind of thought of that mentally, as like, that's the pagans, that's the heathens, that's in some dark jungle they're doing weird things and i don't want anything to do with that so i'm going to believe in jesus like as if there's no alternative and it's it's an interesting dynamic yeah yeah i think yeah church of england is very much like that it's very much just the default thing rather than something anybody thinks that much about it's just like that there is this and then there is other yeah Yeah. all the bad guys what you mentioned that your angry atheist phase what was what was your anger mostly about i think um a little bit of me did resent um you know the the fact that that stuff is taught to us as kids without we don't really have any say or control like I said I had a very like nice secular household with a like very accepting family and religion didn't really ever come into that but and and I was never sent to like a religious specifically religious schools or anything like that but the fact that I was still exposed to it made me feel like that's really this is this is rubbish um why I think I just uh I was very grumpy about anything that I felt was deceptive which probably it's sort of explains a lot where I come from now with my content and things but like I remember being angry about Santa Claus and the tooth fairy as well you know like they told you they were real 
yeah, the idea that they're telling us these lies <laughs> just made me so, so cross and upset. And then when you came across somebody who was a genuine believer, and I think it's interesting that, um, comfy, um, my most like, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would call them fundamentalists, but my most, um, you know, my friends with the biggest beliefs, they were, say, homeschooled on uh, an American curriculum. Um, so they did a Christian homeschooling that was America based. And I just, yeah. And, and it was like, when you see people who are genuinely convicted in their faith, you have things like eventually, you know, especially when you're like teenagers, like I said, you have these conversations where you're like, do you think I'm going to hell? And they they say, yeah. And then, and that's, it's difficult for like kids to get behind, but also then that, that leads to just wider questions of how can, how can people exist and be happy and comfortable knowing their friends are going to suffer this terrible fate and why why are we imposing that kind of stress on children and yeah and so I I just I was very like watching all the documentaries and reading all the Dawkins and you know um feeling very righteous but not actually doing anything because I was just a teenager sitting at home on my own um and yeah I just yeah just slightly bitter at the at the system in general and still a bit yeah a bit cross that there's no there's no legal precedent here either for separating religion from kids upbringing in any way it's it's legal and normal and totally fine so i just yeah it's very sad it, it is it's it's troubling and i feel like it's good that so many people are bringing that issue of the psychological child abuse to the forefront of a lot of people's minds but the idea too that kids have no ability to discern. I mean, if, if you told them it was a different God, if you told them it was many gods, if you told them for sure, you know, in, in a militant sense, there's definitely no gods. Um, we know whatever you tell kids, there's, there's no ability for them to filter through it. And so I love, for example, in my home, being able to say to kids, this is what I believe. But if you believe, decide to believe something different, that's okay. But like to talk about it, like, let's talk about why you know, daddy believes that there's no gods and why some people believe that it, there are gods. And, you know, if they believe in their gods, well, where did that idea come from? How did they develop it? And did it, did it evolve from a different story and from certain other stories? And I, I love how with, with my kids, for example, I talk a lot about how in the, in the new Testament, the, a lot of the stories, I don't know if you've dove into this much yet, but they are very clearly copied from Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, which, you know, I went to, school and Bible college, I've knew them about the Bible but forwards and backwards, and I never, ever heard that stuff. Um, and I never knew that it quotes uh, the canonical New Testament. Protestant New Testament quotes the book of Enoch well over a hundred times. Like, they just don't tell you where it comes from. And so to be able to yeah. tell kids, like, can I tell you, you know, Hermes walks on water with golden slippers and, you know, Jesus walks on water. And, you know, in the Odyssey, there's two, you know, feedings of these, you know, large crowds. And, you know, then there's two feedings from Jesus of large crowds and, you know, all kinds of stuff that is very clearly not just influenced, but actual copied. And in some points, it's literally like what we would almost call plagiarism, where they're literally copying entire phrases from a Greek epic and plopping it right into the, you know, Christian New Testament. But just to be able to give kids the, the knowledge to say, like, look, if you want to believe something, fine, but I'm going to give you all the information so that you have an informed decision and also the lack of a threat to say, like, look, if you don't believe like me, that's cool. As opposed to if you don't believe like me, you're probably going to burn for that. Like, that's just, it's very sad. It's very troubling. Do Can I ask too about when you were growing up, I assume that they kept probably the Christian Bible stories to the nicer ones, the PG ones. But when you got older and began to realize there was some nasty stuff in the Bible, um, even stuff that Christians would applaud, like, Abraham being willing to sacrifice Isaac on the altar to please God, um, you know, God slaughter, slaughtering all the Egyptian firstborn children. Mm -hmm. some, some nasty stuff in there, and it gets a lot worse than that, obviously. But when you began to see that, did you, did you go through any phases of like surprise about what this God is actually described as? Oh, yeah. Huge surprise. Like you said, it was very kept to the PG nice things. I mean... 
we uh we had stuff like Noah's Ark, but that was more like all the animals and it's so they're so cute and look at them all saving them all on the boat you know that everything was very kidified and made to just seem nice um and like when you when you discover just the the amount of murder and genocide and things that god is either commanding or just okaying or like praising people for because I had in my mind the like God is an all loving God before I got into that I I just couldn't pass the God that I was being told about with the Bible it just didn't they didn't gel for me and that's something that I was always like I found really difficult and um I especially I kind of came back to this sort of later in life because um my dad was actually an atheist his whole life and then converted in his um in his older years really and i kind of i talked to him a lot about it at first you know we were so i found it really interesting and i thought the christianity okay, christianity and very he started very um kind of literalist as well you know young earth um yeah great flood real all of trying to tell me about spider kind and you know the whole the full package um and i kind of thought well he's a very intelligent man and he he likes research. He's not possibly the best at discerning what is good from bad in terms of a source, but let's hear where he's coming from. And the main kind of thing that I sort of got from him and from other people that I've talked to is that like, if you read the Bible with, you know, an open heart and your, your mind is open to it, then you, you, you know, you're supposed to feel the Holy spirit or just, just have some understanding and it'll, it, it's, it should kind of make sense and feel right. And I just, I tried, <laughs> I tried and I just, from like page one, it's so violent and God is so angry and contradictory. And I just felt, it felt so contrary to my moral compass. I just couldn't understand it. And I just, I thought, well, I guess my third eye is closed to it or I don't know, but I, I just can't get past what this, I, I, if that is God, then I don't understand why my internal morals just don't gel even remotely with this holy book. Um, yeah. And then obviously you get into the side of looking up where the stories have come from, you know, the how many uh, copies of copies of copies we've actually got compared to original texts and all of the um, the deep kind of intellectual side of it. And it's like, okay, that's, yeah, this isn't, this isn't a headspace I could get into, I don't think, one of belief. Is your dad still into that? He is, yeah. We don't really talk much anymore, which is a shame. But um, about that or at all? Just just in general, because uh it's kind of it I think when he goes very big into things, he he used to be into quite a lot of conspiracy theories, and he mm. sort of traded that for and he's a lot happier now. It's much better than the conspiracy theories he thought um but when your eternal soul is on the line that kind of comes between a relationship or it can come between a relationship more sort of strongly than I think any other sort of issue and because he started off quite literalist we had issues around my sexuality and you know um he uh he ended a relationship he'd been in been in for a long time because uh his partner who he was engaged to had been married once before and he thought that divorce was not, um, you know, not godly. And so that, you know, it just all of these little sort of things stacked up to be like, well, God comes first, which is a perspective that I understand if you're a believer. But um, as a non-believer, it's a bit it's it's hard to. Yeah. Wow. I, I, you reminded me of another story I know where there's a gentleman who is just a friend of a friend of a friend. But I've heard this story, but he he was divorced and he remarried and the girl that he remarried is just lovely. I think it was her first marriage, but because he felt convicted later that he wasn't sure that his first marriage's divorce was biblical, mm -hmm. he was racked with pain. So here he was with his new wife, fully married, fully committed to her. And yet having trouble just enjoying the slightest, any kind of enjoyment or pleasure in the marriage because he just felt like he should, like this was literally the more that he 
delighted in his current marriage, the more he was sealing his fate of going to hell, most likely. And yeah. like, wow, what a mind job. Like, how do you get past that? It's, I mean, just I mean, if you it's, really believe yeah. it, you can't really get past it. If you really believe that I'm sealing my fate and every time I look at my wife and think, oh, she's so beautiful. That's just another nail in the coffin. I'm burning a little bit hotter now. And it's just like, and that's, you know, obviously time versus eternity. You know, you're like, well, this, this moment of enjoying my life doesn't really matter because forever and ever and ever I'll be in torture. That's just, yeah. you can't live your life. You can't enjoy anything. It's devastating, especially because, you know, even within faith, marriage is like such a beautiful thing being committed and happy with one person. If you just sort of look at it from an objective sort of moral perspective, there's what could be, what could be wrong with that? You know, it's, yeah. yeah, it's really sad. Crazy. I do want to ask, um, as you were going through the time frame when you began to say to yourself that you were seeing that this was culturally a Christianity that everyone was participating in, a few people were literalists, fundamentalists, um, extremists even, but you were saying this, this doesn't add up, this doesn't sound right. One of the issues that comes up for a lot of people, pretty heavy and hard, is this idea of the afterlife. How did you process that? Where have you landed so far? Um, and were you okay with it if if you decided there wasn't one? Did you you know did you struggle with with that? If you thought for a while, maybe as a kid, kind of like Santa Claus thing, I thought there was something and I really wanted it. Um, I wanted to live forever. How did you process that whole thing? And if there was anyone that you knew that had died that you expected to see again, you know, anything like that that was weaving into your perspective on it? How did that all pan out for you? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's it's such a difficult thing, especially when you're a kid, to try and deal with. Um, and uh, weirdly, the well, maybe not weirdly, but coincidentally, one of the sort of earliest kind of deaths of someone that I knew in like a respect of an adult in my life kind of thing was was the vicar that came to our school passed away. Mm. Um, and that was, you know, very sad. Um, and it was sort of a, it was a difficult thing because you're aware that per his beliefs and his worldview, he's just moving on to, you know, the next way better, amazing thing. And you're like, when you're at the same time, you're in the process of working out whether or not this is a real thing or not, you're like, it almost feels like, you know, when you're a kid and you're like, in your head, you're like, okay, God, if I do this thing uh, 10 times today, will you help me pass my math test or something? You're almost like, if I, okay, if I believe in it, will that mean that it's true? And then he'll be happy and in the afterlife. Um, and that when you start to think, okay, I, I think I still don't believe in it. And that means that this idea of the afterlife and being, uh, you know, sort of one with God for eternity and having that peace. I don't know if I believe that. I don't know if there's any evidence that that exists. So what's what's happened to the people that have gone? What will happen to me? That's, yeah, that's rough. <laughs> that's really rough. Um, I think <clears throat> I think I kind of, I think that's also part of why I enjoy diving into the sort of, you know, the the textual study and uh, the scientific side of things because, I I like this this sort of idea that it doesn't matter if we don't know and that there could be something and I really I actually really enjoyed studying um religion in school because you got this amazing breadth of what people believe in different afterlifes and reincarnation and there's all these different ideas and you think okay well everybody has a different idea of what happens afterwards maybe nothing happens maybe something nice happens there's there's too much out there for me to be able to know what the truth is and so there's nothing I can do to change it there's nothing I can do to find out like I can't put in the big list what everybody believes might happen after we die and then work through it one by one I'll just I'll never know and then I'll die and then I guess we'll find out and I think I kind of find that quite relaxing and I think that um my sort of attitude of being like yeah it's great to say we don't know I think the fact that I sort of got into that quite young kind of helped um it's still 
even even now you know if somebody passes away uh, there's still that sort of question of especially if they are a believer you know it's it would be so much nicer and it would bring so much comfort to to try and and that's part of what you know my life has made me really try and like like I, I'd love to be a believer. I'd love to believe that it would be so comforting, but I just, I just don't, and I can't. So we just have to deal with whatever there is, which is a big question mark. Um, and that's, that's okay yeah. for me. I think. If you could, like, where you, where you taught that you would have a heaven or some kind of afterlife as a, as a young child, was that kind of like the Santa Claus thing? Yeah. Um, again, it was very sort of wishy washy. Just you know, whatever they said in school, heaven was just like an idea. I almost had like a cartoon idea of heaven because my only exposure to it was like a little bit of religious teaching when, and mostly what it was, was, you know, it was about being one with God and it wasn't necessarily a place or more of a feeling and whatever, but then, you know, movies and TV, heaven was a place in the clouds with like blue skies and seeing all your loved ones or whatever. Um, so I think it was just like a, <laughs> like the kids, the very much basic kids interpretation of heaven was what I kind of, uh, <laughs> what I kind of saw. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Everything's going to be perfect and wonderful and rainbows everywhere. And... Yeah. Yeah. I always think of, um, I can't remember the name of it now, but there's a movie where um, I think he's a, a painter and he dies and his heaven is all, he paints it all. To life and his dog is there and that was sort of the idea <laughs> that was what I kind of saw was that Robin Williams what dreams may come yes what dreams may come that yeah. was it that yeah. was I love that movie yeah that was fantastic yeah that's really sweet that's a sweet movie yeah. yeah in in terms of just a comment off the afterlife thing that for me that was one of the hardest parts I would say and I, I still honestly kind of cringe at times over it you know this whole thing has its roots pretty deep in you I was on the, not on the fence, but I was investigating and studying. And so there were cracks growing for about four years, but I've actually like at a point where I'd, I literally had an hour where I just sat at this computer and I was like, suddenly just like hit me. Like, I don't think this is real. And within an hour I was completely gone. Like I was just out wow. like an hour before I was, a, you know, I would have said Christ is Lord. And an hour later I was like, this is, this, this is just mythology, nothing but mythology, but mm -hmm it hits you pretty quickly, the ramifications. And I was more of the young earth creationist perspective. So it hits you quickly, of course, that evolution is probably true. The earth is probably really, really old and compared to what I thought. And, and then the afterlife, like, oh, wait, what does that mean about death? Like, I don't go anywhere. And it, I, I've heard, I've got a, a very good friend, love him to death over actually in, uh, in England as well. But um, he, says you wouldn't want to live forever. You don't, you can't conceive of how long forever is. You would get bored out of your mind at some point. And I get his point and I think he's probably got something, but I'm one of those people that's like never bored. I've always got a million projects. Mm -hmm. um, even for like, I, I've got ideas for my YouTube channel for monologues that I want to do and just, you know, just pick a topic and then go ask a bunch of people for their feedback and read a bunch of things and then, you know, draft a nice little, topical thing and go through it and then make a video of it of some thoughts on a certain topic i've got probably 500 topical things lined up i'll never get to them in my lifetime and I'm, I'm sure i'll have a couple thousand before long and you know endless books i want to read uh, i want to learn how to do what you do vfx be a better photographer you know on and on and on i could go for hours about hobbies that i have and want to develop and hobbies i don't have yet but i want to develop places i want to go things i want to see i feel like i could do that forever and ever and ever and i personally still cling to this idea of I would, I think I would have wanted to actually live forever. If I'm weird in that, mm -hmm. that's fine. But I wanted it. I wanted it. I wanted forever. And to not to realize you will not have it. And in fact, your forever is at max, you know, 80, 90 years if at best. And the last few years of that probably won't be that pleasant. So at best, you know, 70, 75 years, you've already lived over half of them. So half of your forever is already gone. And to that, when that hit me, it's like, wow, this, that was a bitter pill to swallow, a very bitter pill. Yeah. And I wasn't angry per se, but I mean, I guess I was in some ways, but it was more just like, I wasted a lot of time. And, I, you know, I was like, I was one of those street preachers. I didn't preach much on the street, but I did some, I did more um, child evangelism stuff in Philadelphia and a lot of, you know, soup kitchen preaching where I'd preach in front of, 
you know, homeless people, you know, they kind of line up for their soup and their sandwich and you get yeah. them for half. If they want, if they want to eat their meal, they have to sit there and listen to your 30 minutes. And of course it's always the gospel because, you know, homeless people could die that night because it's cold outside, blah, blah, blah. And so just get them the gospel, gospel, gospel. So they heard it, you know, at least a few times a week. Um, you need to trust Christ as your savior. And I was one of those people. And so it was real to me. And so to, when I got out, it was like, this is just, I've wasted so much of my life. Did you, it sounded like you avoided that for the most part then in terms of feeling yeah. like you wasted your life? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, I, yeah. Cause that, that, those struggles were very like young for me and, uh, there wasn't any, you know, uh, aside from a little bit of time in church here and there, I didn't, I didn't uh, feel like I dedicated that much to it and probably quite a lot of mental process, but in terms of like my life, I didn't, uh, I didn't spend too much time sort of dedicated to any church or anything. Um, mm, but I, awesome. I, feel very strongly for for that it's it's like a weird it's like a almost a two two-pronged thing isn't it where on one half you're like it would it would feel better probably and more comforting to think that there is forever and to feel like you you know that on the other hand if there isn't forever is it better to know that and try and make this short life as beautiful as possible um, and I think, yeah, that's, I think that's kind of a thing that a lot of people struggle with. Yeah. I think the other thing along the lines of what you just said this, I would struggle with is I don't feel like I've had certain traumatic and almost terroristic losses, such as, you know, I've got four beautiful children, um, age seven and younger. None of them have died as far as I know, none of them have cancer, but I know, you know, parents do struggle with that. And what, what do you do when your, you know, two, three-year-old dies of, of leukemia? Um, or, you know, has some lifelong issue that's just going to pretty much ravage their whole life, however long they live. And you just think they deserve to live. You know, they deserve a life and, and to, to realize they're not going to get it. That was really hard for me to realize kind of from an evolutionary perspective, I'm almost like, it just, it is what it is. Some, some things in life are not going to work out. And I don't know if this is resonates with you. And this is, this is a weird quirky thing. I'd, I'd be curious if you how you feel out of it. I don't know why, but when I was growing up, I just never really saw a video of snakes eating. And when I saw snakes eating, whether they, they go grab a frog and they don't eat, they don't kill the frog for the most part. Some of them, you know, they do the poison, then they wait till the poison kills the, the animal and then they mm -hmm. kill, eat it. But a lot of them just eat frogs alive. And I thought, I know this is going to, this sounds weird, but I thought, that probably happens, you know, thousands, millions of times a day, for sure. You know, billions of times a mm -hmm. year, animals get eaten alive, not just killed, but eaten alive. And I thought the world is beautiful in one sense, but it's also very brutal. And if we came from, you know, we, we all have a common ancestor, I believe at this point, you know, that we came from that same line. The world's not fighting to keep those frogs from a terrible demise. And the world's not fighting to keep me from a terrible demise. Nobody's fighting for me. No one's fighting for my kids. It's just, for lack of a better phrase, the, the luck of the draw. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that to me shakes me up a lot. And I think, I think a lot of people realize that like, if you are it's saying there's no one looking out for you, there's no afterlife, there's no reason that things have to be, get better. They could get a lot worse. For some people, they struggle with how dark that worldview seems. And I was wondering if you could relate at all. And what you what you would say to someone who would say, your your worldview is so dark and nihilistic that I wouldn't even if even if it were true that Christianity were mythology, I wouldn't want your worldview as a replacement. Like, how would you respond mm. to that? Mm, yeah, well, yeah, I I hear that kind of thing quite a lot, and it, it it is dark. It's it's a matter of perspective as well, because obviously there is you know we could sit here for days and talk about everything that is so beautiful in the world especially when it comes from human beings because we have our free will and we can make choices that are incredibly positive and incredibly negative and uh yeah there's a there's a there's a way to view the world in a sort of nihilistic view that is yeah a quite um quite potent but i don't know i i kind of i almost feel like i've always had the opposite experience where when I've tried to think about the fact that there is so much awful suffering, the fact that there are, I can't, I was looking at this 
a while ago, however many um, thousands of children per day, like under two that are dying of AIDS um, and people that are getting cancer and it's these mutations of the cell and why does that happen? Trying to pass that with, like I said earlier, a loving God who is there and will intervene and interact in our lives is just confusing and I, I think more frightening and difficult for me because if there's a you know if there's a god out there that will look out for you and look after you if you're um, a, a good enough person and you love him why hasn't he stopped x y and z terrible thing happening to me like there's suddenly a lot more responsibility on you to be you know perfectly righteous so that you and your loved ones and everyone can be uh, protected I think almost the sort of luck of the draw element kind of makes me feel a bit better it almost takes away a little bit of that responsibility like we're not we're not responsible for everything bad that happens to us and happens to the world sometimes bad things just happen to good people and it yeah. sucks and it might feel a bit dark but all we can do is use our free will to make good things happen and that's what we are responsible for. Um, yeah. yeah. I like that perspective. And yeah, I think pursuing the beauty of life is a big, big deal. And I love to the phrase, leaving things better than you found it. And just to say like, there are some really sad things about this world, but I can't fix all of them. I can't fix even most of them, but I can fix a few for a few people. And I'll do my best to do that and leave, leave people better than, you know, even something like, um, you know, you, you talk about, kids dying and i think a lot about the the ones where it's not even medical it's just poverty to think like yeah. what what can we do to try to shuffle more money to a agencies that can give food and you know the idea of like you know my kids they eat like too much <laughs> they're just they're always asking for snacks but i just think mm -hmm. you know it breaks your heart to think about a kid asking for uh, their parents to give them money i'm sorry to give them food and to think about like their parents saying i'm sorry sweetie but there's nothing to give you and there probably won't be anything yeah. more tomorrow and I think realizing that that's the plight of a lot of people, it just drives you to think, well, I'm going to make a difference. This is, this is no, this isn't someone else's job, but this is my job. I'm going to make a difference in this world and I will leave it better than we found it. And I love too the philosophical way of doing that, of like what you're doing and what, what I'm doing and other people to say like, let's leave it better than we found it in the sense of let's, let's try to help people escape mythological worldviews so that they can focus on reality. <clears throat> but mm -hmm. I do want to ask um, a couple slightly different topics too. I wanted to go back to your story a little bit. Sure. Sexuality. Um, a lot of people struggle. And it sounds like I'm going to guess you didn't struggle the same way, which is great uh, with, with the whole uh, guilt culture, modesty culture, shame culture, um, you know, don't show too much skin. Um, but a lot of people would struggle, even if they were on the outside, um, you know, if it was the, the girls, if they were very modest in their dress, not too showy and the guys that they kind of looked, you know, suit and tie kind of guys they just did the right thing and they look like they were following the rules so to speak for for not doing anything wrong and they mm -hmm. were adhering at least verbally to the idea of i'm going to keep myself pure i'm not going to dwell on things i'm not going to be you know dressing girls in my mind and all that but a lot of people would still say in on the inside in my mind once the hormones hit obviously and once i start realizing you know, there's attractions I start to feel guilty just, just purely because I'm sexual, just the, not, not because I even did anything. I just feel like I am thinking about things and I shouldn't probably be. I should be focused on the Lord and the kingdom and the gospel, on the church, on, uh, you know, righteousness and holiness. And if God opens up the doors for me to be, you know, in a, in, a, in a relationship in the future that includes that blessing, at that point, I'll think about it then. But until then, I should probably kind of be not just celibate physically, but celibate mentally. Mm -hmm. And the whole shame of that obviously sounds like a, like a holding a firecracker in your hand and lighting it when it blows up in your face and, and doesn't work out so well, people feel so guilty. And I'm just wondering, did you feel like your experience was different than that? And if there was any part of that that was still there from, from the Christianity you were exposed to, what was that like? And just how did sexuality evolve in your world as you, you were a teenager? Yeah. I mean, like you say, the, the, trying not to, it's you know that thing where it's like try not to think about an elephant and then you can't think about anything but an elephant I feel like it's like that when you're growing up with sexuality and things as well like the more you try not to think about something the worse it is and it's just like a human impossibility when you're being flooded with hormones to not like 
be attracted to people or you know um so it's something that i i don't think christianity affected me too much with it i definitely had a lot of um internal and external stigma around um like being attracted to girls when i was a teenager um and i think part of that stems from religious people around me um i just it's so there's just i think it's more cultural but i think it's the way that um certain religions and traditions have sort of infected um the the culture and the society and this is what what i'm saying about like the uk being more sort of traditional than anything else i think we've held on to a lot of the kind of modesty culture and purity culture without even necessarily having the why and not necessarily going back to the word about it but just it's always been bad and so it always is bad um and yeah there, so there was a lot of um there was a lot of uh like shaming when I was a kid about especially when like girls started developing um and everyone would go crazy if a girl was wearing like a vest and you could tell that she like had breasts and it would be like that's she's doing everything for attention she's so awful and bad and so there was like a lot of that when I was growing up um but I I think it was easier to get over without having any kind of fundamentalist views without having to like challenge you know a uh, a higher power to answer to for those things because when you realize that it's just people clinging on to you know a certain ideology and you think you know and I talk a lot about feminism I did a lot of research into sort of early feminism and you're sort of learning where a lot of these things come from the fact that a lot of um you know in the bible a lot of uh what we talk about of marriage and you know the origins of marriage in history and stuff it's more sort of talking about ownership to sort of benefit men and you start thinking well these are just these are just human things designed to promote you know whatever agenda was happening at the time and it's a lot easier to let go of that because okay here's a here's a bad thing that people do people say this is a good thing this is why they promote it and therefore I don't have to worry about it I can see it would be a lot harder if you did have to wrestle with the demons of actually being like believing that that is uh something that comes from from god and not just from you know the people who were influencing the politics of the time that the bible was being written you know yeah for sure yeah it's it's great to hear that you were spared a lot of that because it's it i'm sure you've picked up on this from other <clears throat> from other youtubers and so forth but it's a big big topic and for a lot of people, there was this sense of you, if you did actually did anything, like you crossed any actual lines, you might be okay in the sense that you might still get married and have a nice marriage, but you kind of, you have a scarlet letter, so to speak, over you. You do have a black cloud of, you know, you, you, you've really started your, the most important years of your adult life off on the wrong foot. And you kind of gave God the finger and now you're kind of hoping that God will kind of bless you anyway, despite your really bad re rebellion against his rules. And mm -hmm. it's like, it's just, it's not going to work out that well. And so people have this constant feeling of, man, I shouldn't have done that. And just, especially if it was public, if it was just private, it's one thing, but if it was public and kind of everyone knows you, you really messed up. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of hard, but then also I think even people that didn't do anything like that, guys, I know, especially speaking for the guy side, they just feel like they're constantly guilty. You reminded me of um, a couple of friends I had growing up who um, were in a relationship and this was like 17, 18. So um, especially in the UK, they were, you know, above the age of consent and sort of more or less considered adults anyway. And they did, they didn't do anything in their relationship because he was a fundamentalist Christian. She was an atheist, but just the, I think at the time nobody knew until sort of years later when they were finally able to talk about it but the the guilt and the pain that it caused him and her and she felt rejected and unattractive because he was so convicted that he couldn't have any sexual thoughts or feelings at all and had to just keep her at such a distance to prevent any of that and 
it made his family worry and then it made his family be not very nice to her and that hurt her more and just the amount of devastation in just this one relationship between two teenagers where they didn't even do anything just because there was that risk of just even thinking sexual things or you know kissing too much might lead you know the slippery slope concern and just like the amount of people that that hurt and the years it took to undo that like one teenage relationship it's just I think it's it's devastating that that's like so it's just really that that can even have such an impact on you know an atheist in that relationship it's just yeah it says a lot I think Mm. it's so sad to hear yeah and it's those kind of stories just go on and on. There's so many of them. And mm-hmm. you really, they're, they're basically asking Christians to flip a switch that you can't flip, like to say, you know, don't, 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 don't think about it. Don't do it. Don't, don't act like it's part of your life. It's just, you know, sideline it completely. And then that, you know, you're supposed to get married and flip a switch and say, now just jump in and enjoy it. And a lot of people can't. And I, I remember reading a book about um, this chaplain, the college chaplain who in here in the U S and he would get, people coming into his office to, you know, to get counsel for different issues they were dealing with. Mm-hmm. And he would, he said that he had some girls who in, in college had, they were married, you know, fairly young, but they were coming to him for, for some kind of, you know, quasi church counseling as the, as the school um, chaplain. And they had in their preteen years and teenage years gone to these concerts in the U S with a guy named Josh McDowell, probably not a name you've heard, but I think so. he used to do these concerts and these, um, church events where he would really encourage people to pledge to not have sex before marriage, to pledge your virginity mm-hmm. to Jesus. And so the way this chaplain described it, he said, these girls basically in their teenage years pledged their virginity to Josh McDowell, this preacher, and now they're married and they they hated sex and they wanted to die. And he said, this was just like a repeated motif. And it really, it just breaks my heart, um, the, the way that it works. And it, honestly, too, the, the other side effect too, is if, if you're if you're in a marriage where one of you is deconverted, there is a huge tendency, and I get emails from people every week about this. If one of you deconverts, the other person doesn't want to be touched. It's like, if you don't love Jesus, then I don't really love you anymore. And that's that's wow. another big side effect of it. But I wanted to go back to your story. You, you talked about being attracted to girls. Mm-hmm. Was there any pushback or shame from the culture around you, especially from the Christians, when you admitted that to anybody? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it was um, it was kind of a confusing time in general when I was uh, sort of, because this was maybe like a 15, 16, so it's sort of been like, I don't know, 12 years ago or something like that. Um, and I grew up in more of a sort of small village area. Uh, so it's a little bit, I guess I might have had a, if I've been in London or something at the time, I might have had a different kind of experience. But um, bisexuality was not a thing that I or anyone around me was sort of aware of. So I had a lot of confusion over, I was like briefly a lesbian and then I went back, oh, but I'm still attracted to men. It's very confusing. Um, and uh, there was a lot of, the the stigma wasn't very specific. It was just sort of like, it was just bad. It's just wrong and, and funny and something that we're a little bit afraid of. So we're just going to take the mick. Like even, you know, friends of mine who weren't, out at the time or you know would stray even like it would be like those two they're, they're probably lesbians because they're not dating boys or whatever and it was very like sort of a you know sniggers behind uh behind closed doors kind of thing and um I got I got the idea that it was a fad a lot um yeah just it, it was very even when I was a kid, you know, it's not that long ago. It still was very much drilled in the idea that, you know, you grow up, you find a nice boy, you get married and then everything else. Um, and then having that suddenly be like, well, is that what's going to happen? And what happens if that isn't the case? Because this everybody's saying that that's what you should do and what you've got to do, um, especially your friends who are religious. And you're like, are this I'm not really sure and it almost I I remember when I was like that age and sort of dealing with that I almost felt like maybe I should just go completely off the other end then and just like live a wild crazy life and just you know because you didn't feel like there was that middle ground of just 
that you know whatever sexuality is just normal and that's just part of being a regular person it was like well maybe I just I have to be like a full rebel and you know go off and ride a motorcycle into the sunset because because <laughs> I've gone so straight so far from the path um did you have anyone you could talk I, to about it like to walk through it with you I um I I sort of started to as I was older I kind of I was lucky that I sort of grew up with the internet and uh and media was starting to be more accepting and showing um I remember tv shows started showing bisexual people and I was like this is a real thing um and so I started being able to have people to reach out to but it was like where I grew up was kind of a relatively small sort of community where it's like mostly elderly white people you know it wasn't very uh diverse and there wasn't really nobody talked about sexuality or anything like that so it was very much like the the coming of the internet that like was my uh my escape to like understanding um but even even through that I got like um I remember I remember like my dad saying that you know this there's everybody on tv is bisexual nowadays it's all a big fad it's all a trend and that's sort of me being like okay well I can't I can't say anything to like my family or anything about it then because this is going to be you know this is going to be something that they're really against um and like I was really close with my grandparents growing up I still am um but uh they in younger life were you know churchgoers and things like that and it was never clear at some point they stopped going it was never clear when I was younger if they still what they believed what they held on to so I just sort of just didn't talk about it just in case you know um because that's sort of just just again that's just traditionalism it's so pervasive that it was like well just in case they believe that this is a sin and that I'm going to hell I just won't tell them um <laughs> and uh later in life everybody fine nobody cares um but yeah when when that like that little bit of religion is just sort of seeped into everything especially school you just you just don't know what's right and what's safe and what even what other people believe so yeah I basically I I fled to the internet for my discussions on sexuality um and I was really lucky to have that I think yeah it seems like it's been such a big game changer and across the the board for so many of these topics to be able to find community even if you can't find it literally right up the street you can find it somewhere and get connected and yeah, it's sure. it's weird that sometimes the people on the internet who are like you may not even meet many of them and you know you you know some of them you get to be real good friends with and chat you know offline and all that but like a lot of them are just they're purely online people but they end up meaning sometimes more to you than the people that are right next to you it's a very strange dynamic but it's like you you mm -hmm. have you have to have community to be healthy you just you have to and if you're yeah, your absolutely. physical people around you won't get that community you have to find it somewhere else did you i'm curious with kind of same question but zooming out from sexuality to atheism mm -hmm. as you began to talk about it and especially as you began to do your youtube channel like at what points you became more vocal about it did you find people sh shunning you at all did you find any pushback or people um you know telling you especially like look you you're not just like in danger of going to hell but you're actually now doing the devil's work you're like you're it's one thing to say i don't reach you know i don't i don't trust jesus personally but it's another thing to actually help other people to say the same thing um you're kind of you know for lack of a better phrase you're becoming an atheist evangelist at that point mm -hmm. once you create a platform did people push back how did that all work and then what is i mean do you, do, you, do you currently get any pushback from people so i definitely have had that pushback um there's obviously a lot more of that in the online space than uh than in my personal life but i've had a lot of people friends and family just kind of approach me and be like i just think it would be better if you just didn't talk about this at all um like there's people sort of in my uh kind of extended family who are religious there's some people who are catholic and are raising their children say catholic and obviously i I'm quite vocal online about not being for that. I don't think you should raise a child in a specific religion. And there is definitely an element of, could you just, it would just make it our lives easier if you just didn't, <laughs> if, you, if you were just not. Um, and I, I try really hard to be as like 
objective and kind as I can be when I'm having those discussions to the point where I feel like I'm comfortable with the people in my life seeing those things um and you know when it does get backlash if it does upset somebody I think there's a more important and interesting discussion to be had there because I feel like I've been you know reasonable in my stating my beliefs um so there's been a little bit of that uh and then you know in terms of like uh online spaces like every day I get you're you're going to hell um you are doing the devil's work um I somebody told me I was a false prophet I've been uh called like a yeah like an a agent of the devil um somebody said I was the devil which I thought was like quite you know high praise for just <laughs> just little old me um and I think it's it's interesting because the actual conversations we have Obviously, it's challenging fundamentalist Christianity a lot of the time, which if you believe in that, then you probably would see that as a negative. But I don't think if you actually watch the sort of conversations we have online, it's not that there's no uh, we're not particularly promoting like an anti-religious agenda or uh, promoting a demonic agenda. <laughs> I think it's, it, there's just a little bit of a knee jerk sort of fear reaction, especially just with what people just associate with atheist like I think sometimes people see the word atheist and have all these assumptions about what you believe and what you're saying and what you're doing and how you're harming people um and so I think a lot of the pushback kind of comes from that and therefore I'm sort of comfortable in pushing the pushback back and being like I'm I'm kind of happy with what I do now and uh in my personal life I know like some people just don't watch certain certain videos I do if I do any videos on atheism or religion they just avoid them and that they but they support me with other things and I'm totally fine with that like that that works for me um yeah there's there's been a couple of people that have would have preferred me to just stop overall and uh those can be quite difficult conversations but I I think I feel vindicated in what I make and what I put out there being not evil and therefore i'm i'm happy to challenge that now if anybody yeah if anybody does push back it's amazing when you hear those pushbacks about just why don't you like if you don't believe just fine just don't believe but go quietly into the night and just be mm -hmm. your quiet atheist and and yet those same people would probably say that they for religious reasons would fight for justice and fight for the oppressed and it's like if you for example escaped north korea and say you just situation you would have loved to have gotten your whole family out, but you still have a ton of family there. And you know that, you know, some of them are in danger of if they even, you know, blink the wrong way, they're going to get put in prison and beaten. Um, they're starving and they're being told to pledge allegiance to the dear leader every day and all that. And it's just, it's a horrible, oppressive situation. And, and you get to escape and come to South Korea or, or the States or the UK or something. And you now have a really good, life you know your life's pretty pretty nice compared to where it was before and and yet you're just doing everything you can to help your family escape to be concerned for them to spread the word about how bad it is like everybody would be like of course good job like it's so important we need to change that culture they need to be free and to change this you know this religion of the dear leader over there and and yet you do the same thing and especially when you're talking about children being indoctrinated into horrible ideas you try to free them and everyone is suddenly up in arms and it's like it's the same exact thing we we won't be quiet because there are people still stuck in a mental prison and i wanted to ask kind of about that too in terms of your personal conversations with people when you talk to people who you can tell they're neck deep in this stuff this is absolutely real to them mm -hmm. how do you handle those conversations where they're trying to actually proselytize, trying to tell you the Bible is truth, it's God's truth, that you need Jesus. Um, you mentioned the whole idea of the street preachers in London. But, you know, if you're talking to a preacher, or even just talking to a friend who really believes this, um, especially someone that's that's maybe more respectful and just is like, I really want to hear what you have to say, but mm -hmm. then I want to tell you what I think, which is, you know, the Christianity message. And as, you, as you're listening to them, you you can tell that they're truly not open to, the, to this just one idea, they might be wrong. There's no way that will cross their mind. There's no way they will allow it in the conversation. Your worldview might be completely backwards. 
how like do you talk to people like that how do you talk to them and and like have you ever had any experiences where that's gone really well where they've said you know what you made some really good points i can't really back up my perspective anymore i'm going to do some digging because i need to have an answer this doesn't make sense to write absolutely or like how does that how do they typically work out or, or do you just avoid them altogether and say you know i <laughs> hope you get out but i'm not going to deal with your nonsense yeah, I mean, I've had the range of good and bad and just I find a lot of people tend to just shut down um, if they really aren't open to a lot of people will say they want to have the discussion. But if they aren't, everything kind of hinges on the idea that they might be wrong, that this might not be true. And if they aren't willing to challenge that, the discussion can't really happen and they just sort of shut it down and push back and leave um i sort of i ended up like f facilitating a discussion between um a christian person who was not very fundamentalist and a mormon and the uh the person who was not so fundamentalist was sort of just trying to ask questions about the history of the book and this and that and it got to the point where i think the, the, the mormon person um i'm sorry the, the history of the mormon books the Book of Mormon, yeah. Um, okay. And it got to this point where um, there was sort of no more, because they were talking specifically about history of, um, you know, the the scriptures. Um, and it got to this point where there was nothing more sort of, it would be the point where if you were open to it, you would have to say, maybe you're right, the history is a little bit, I'm not sure, I'll have to go and look into that. That's when they just got angry and shut down, which I think is like a risk a lot of the time. And I, I don't know the best way to deal with that. I have had a couple of conversations with people where it's gone well in the sense that we, we've sort of focused on like one thing. Um, and that's that's both in religion and in sort of conspiracy theories and things where, uh, you know, somebody said, oh yeah I'm interested to talk about it. I believe this this and this um and then I'll, I'll, I'll okay well let's talk about this bit here's I think um some interesting articles that might that kind of dispel some of the things in that and and that always tends to go quite well because it's not challenging somebody to like shake down their entire I think if you try and say well what if everything you believe is false that's when people just shut down because that's that's a huge like t tsunami of uh, like information and stuff to have to try and deal with. Um, so it, when it's gone well for me, it's been we focused on one specific thing, like a specific historical thing, a specific part of a conspiracy, you know, what some words that somebody said that, you know, we've challenged. Um, that's when it goes well for me. A lot of the time I, I don't engage in those kind of discussions because sometimes people aren't coming into them in a very genuine way and you know that they're not actually open to listening to a different perspective they just want to kind of win an argument so I tend to just ignore those um I also get I I get too many emails saying God's real and I can prove it and and the ones that I've responded to have never managed to prove it so at this point I just I can't I, I can't do it um very occasionally somebody comes in like open willing to discuss um and i've learned i've learned stuff too as well like it's not a one-way street i had a really interesting conversation with someone about theism more broadly and this was somebody i think who grew up fundamentalist and now considers himself a theist but not religious um and they sort of explained their kind of philosophical reasoning for theism and all this really interesting history and it totally like changed my perspective and it was like yeah, it's brilliant like we come away learning something um but those those instances are really really rare, unfortunately. Although I think some of that is just because um, you know social media and YouTube and things is a bit of a a lot of people come just to vent rather than to discuss. So it's again more of a vocal minority. But yeah, it's like sometimes sometimes you can have really good discussions. I don't think I've ever talked anyone out of uh, <laughs> their religion, um, and I don't think I would ever. I don't think I am equipped to do that. I think that I can give people a little bit of information on a specific topic and then maybe they can learn something from that and that's that's kind of it's it's kind of in the individual's hands at that point what they want to how they want to respond and if they are interested in trying to delve more into it or if it's just I think for some people it is just like too much to try and challenge which I also understand yeah it seems like 
you're hitting on the big point there. I think that keeps coming back to me is that it's it's just too much for them. It you're you might not be implying it or you might not be stating it outright in every conversation, but you're implying if you're wrong, then eternity is completely different than what you think it is. And the idea yeah. that heaven and hell might not be the right construct that the Bible might not be real. It's it's almost like it's terrorizing to them. Like you're kind of making them psychologically shake. Like, what mm-hmm. do you mean? You know, you everybody, my pastor, my parents, all the people I know and love that they've told me and confirmed to me, I know I've got the truth and you're telling me I don't. If If there's any possibility that you're correct, then my whole world is upside down and and utterly confused. And again, you know, the implication you've wasted your time, you you've you've given your allegiance to a fantasy and to a phantom. Um, that's it's just bizarre to think about. And it's it's really it's it's not just bizarre, it's scary to think, well, if you're right, if there's even a chance in a million, one in a billion you're right, then wow, that's a I I can't even wrap my mind around that kind of thing. And I, I think that's where a lot of people are, where they're not actually dealing with the topics that we might bring up, such as you might say, does it really make sense to worship Yahweh, who eventually had a son named Jesus, when we can tell, you know, for example, historically, that Yahweh was actually one of many children of Elyon, and Elyon had a wife named Asherah, and they had children, mm-hmm. such as Yahweh and Baal, but then eventually Yahweh became the high god, and he took over, and he was married to Asherah, but then eventually they took her out of the picture, and now it's just Yahweh. It's not Asherah. And, you know, you, you start to bring in his history. It's like they can't even go there with you because they just, it's just too terrorizing. And I think you're, the implication of that, too, for those of us who've deconverted is there's an intellectual honesty that you just have, have to have. You're like You have to be willing to say something like, I want the truth more than I want the status quo and, and the tradition that I've inherited. I want the truth, even if it takes me in a completely different direction than everyone around me. And that's that's a hard thing to really mean to to say and really mean. And I I understand too that the bravery of that too is is wrapped up in a sense where you feel like the God that you at that point up, or up until that point you know that that God is true, and that He's not just there. He's the King. He's the Judge. He's the Ruler. He is just. He is intelligent. And you don't question Him. You just you are <clears throat> the slave. You are the servant. You are the child. He is the King. He is the Father. He is all knowing. You know almost nothing. He's all wise. Your wisdom is foolishness. And for you to sit there and say, I think for the first time in my life, I'm going to give myself the freedom to question God, to question the Bible. The bravery it takes, I mean, it, for, for someone that's outside of it, it's like, of course you have to do that. That's intellectual honesty. But when you're in it and everyone else around you says the same thing, that is such a difficult thing to do. And I say it as someone who's yeah. gone through it, it's on this side, it's like, duh, of course you're going to do that. But when you're in it, it's like that the bravery it takes is, is really difficult to muster. It really is. And I feel yeah, just to turn our attention to peop, at people listening. If you're going through it, you know, kudos to you for, for trying where, whatever stage you're at. Um, keep, keep going at it. But it's, we understand it's painful. And it's, it's, we're not trying to make light of the pain that people go through because these are difficult things, especially when you have a lot to lose. You know that if you, if you pursue this down the right path, you might lose loved ones or at least their respect and, um, or your job or whatever. That's hard. And so, um, you know, blessings to you guys on your, on your journey on that. Cause it's, it's not easy. I wanted to also turn our attention to America. If I could, I, I don't get a chance to talk to people in England too often, mm-hmm. but I did want to ask you since I've got this chance, how do people in England, would, would you call yourself more England or the UK? I'm always confused about which, what's the better way to phrase it. Either. I mean, yeah. England's fine. I tend to, I prefer UK because I'm a bit Scottish and I'm embarrassed okay. of England. So, but okay. <laughs> either way. <laughs> gotcha. So those of you in the UK, how do you perceive, and this is not to be ultra political or anything, but just how do Christians there and, and atheists, how do you all perceive what's going on politically and, and politically slash religiously in America? And does it seem like a concern or do do you find Christians supporting some of the Christian nationalism that's been occurring? It, uh, I mean, it depends, obviously, on on who you ask. A lot of, um, th- there was some pushback, say, uh, during COVID on whether or not churches should be exempt from closing and things like that. And there was a lot of, um, uh, look to America and how America is uh, protecting its churches and things like that. Um, that sort of stuff does come up. But I think as a whole, 
uh, it's seen as much more extreme. Um, and uh, like I say, most religious people in the UK are Church of England, which is a very kind of namby-pamby, wishy-washy, casual, Sundays only type of Christianity. So I think it's like atheists and Christians alike see it as quite an extreme place of uh, radical views. And uh, yeah, I think in general, because it is a bit more sort of secular over here, um, I think when I talk to Christians here, they are sort of tend to be more upset at the representation that Christians seem to have with a lot of like the stuff in the US news, you know, that, because um, things like um, the fundamentalist church groups, you know, protesting funerals and doing things like this, that makes kind of world news. And a lot of Christians I talk to here, actually a lot of Christians I speak to who are American as well, feel like that's uh, almost like an annoyed at that representation of Christianity. Um, it's definitely, yeah, America is looked at as, as quite a, like, out there, sort of fundamentalist place in comparison with here, yeah. Yeah, it's, I would totally agree, and I, looking back on it, I can kind of see the seeds, some of the stuff that I'm, I'm thinking of, you're probably not too familiar with in your background, but there, there was a, a lot of white nationalistic kind of push back, I think, when I was, you know, a young child, and there were there were just there were a lot of people trying to get Christians to be kind of the the the, the person speaking to the, into the ear of the president. You know, it was like Bill, you know Billy Graham, if you're familiar with that name. He was invited mm -hmm. to the White House a lot to talk and give his advice to the president. And this push for you know the our Supreme Court to be mostly people of a Christian worldview, um, you know, mythological worldview there, which is just crazy to me. Um, that the highest court in the land is is mostly filled with people who believe mythology, but um it's you can kind of see it that it was building up and i'm not surprised mm -hmm. in one sense but there there are a lot of people that truly believe that america has a special calling from yahweh and jesus to be the light in the dark to obviously be doing everything they can to you know uh, say israel can do nothing wrong to say that uh, you know we have to have christians at the top level of our nation and it, it's, I feel like in some senses, it's not my push or my thrust at all. I'm mostly focused on just people's stories, but it's gotten to the point where I feel like I've, I've wondered how to best get involved from, from a very sideline perspective, but how to actually speak to it. Because there, there is a, a story in the Bible about a queen named Esther. Have you ever heard of that book? Mm -hmm. And there's a quote in there where it talks about where Esther has is, is got a decision to do something kind of difficult. And I believe it was Mordecai, her uncle, who who says something like, you, you, you think that you are just, you know, like in this situation and you can make your choice. But what if you were placed here specifically for this specific time? For It says for such a time as this, almost like like there's a pivot point. There's a watershed here and your little choices and your little, you know, your little YouTube channel could actually make a big difference on a much bigger scale. And to say, if if you if you found out later that what you thought of was these little teeny efforts, these little teeny steps, that were you know small audience, not making a big difference. What if you found out later that that affected something on a huge scale, on a million, billion, trillion people scale? Would would you be motivated to push harder and and do the right thing here and and try to help people escape? And I kind of feel like looking at this, I'm afraid for my country. I guess that you'd say that. I think the Christian nationalism is probably going to fade out, but I think it has a chance. I think it actually, with the right mix of toxicity, it could actually take over this country um, to the point where they could literally put people in prison for not believing certain things. I don't think that's coming soon, hopefully not anytime soon, but I think it could technically still happen. And I know there's Christians that would do anything they could to make it happen. That if you'd had mm -hmm. a, you'd been a, at an affair outside of marriage, if you were homosexual, anything they would put you in prison or kill you. And I know people that are committed, deeply committed to that mentality, um, that you all deserve to be in prison or die. And someone like yourself, you know, be, having an attraction to women, you would absolutely be in prison or die in certain people's perspectives. Me being an atheist would be, uh, you know, absolutely firing squad as quick as they can for me. 
But I think mm -hmm. it's like it's scary to think that could be within a generation or two what the next group of people are fighting and to say, well, I need to get involved in the fight now, even if it doesn't, even if it's not hitting the fan yet, it might soon. And I feel like that's a big burden on my heart. And I, I'm glad to hear that you're saying Christians are feeling like that's not a good representation of Christianity. Do you ever wonder if that's related to if, Chris, if Muslims feel the same way with like um, when they look at stuff like Al Qaeda and ISIS, if they think? Oh, definitely. Yeah, you see it. You see it a lot. Um, we uh, pro probably talk more about like Islamophobia in the UK than we do about um, anything to do with Christianity because it's more of a sort of prevalent issue. But it means that we are constantly we have good Muslims in the UK being like, this does not represent us and our faith. Um, it's tricky because obviously I I don't I think there's a level of irrationality to any faith of that kind but I do think that religious people are the best place to push back against other religious people and more extreme religious people so convincing religious and non-religious people to try and do the right thing is is really good I think uh it's it's sort of scary the idea of being able to make an impact as well but if it's possible there's been i've had stuff recently where people have um like we did a, a fundraiser on one of my videos for the freedom from religion foundation which is um it, you know they do loads of great stuff in terms of the separation of church and state in the us and people have been saying i didn't know about them until you brought them up and I had, I had this issue in my local area with, um, you know, religion and government coalescing. And so I got in contact with them and they were able to help. And I think, OK, maybe like maybe these small things might actually fight off any potential in, impending doom. We might actually be able to help because it is, it is a bit frightening i mean it's all it's i only get the perspective from like friends and the news and the news is very like fear-mongering anyway so i try and take it with a grain of salt but from the outside it does feel like the tables could flip and america could become a christian nation at any any second almost you know and that's that's you know the amount of power and influence the u.s has that's quite a frightening thing um so i think if if us doing our small bit can can help in any way i think that that's i think that's great and i really hope that it does reach religious people as well because like i, I do really think that those people are really well placed to be able to actually convince others and change others a lot more than a lot more christians are willing to listen to a christian than an atheist you know on on any topic so yeah just fingers crossed that that kind of continues and uh things go in the right direction yeah i like to use the, the expression that if, if if i put when i was a christian if i put a thousand people in the kingdom i want to take a hundred thousand back out <laughs> i just mm -hmm. want to make a big big dent in this well I, yeah. I know i've kept you for a while. i have a, just a few more questions here and then we'll wrap up one question that comes to mind a lot for atheists and i'm just curious how you would answer this um where do you get your morality from if you don't get it from a god i'm sure you've had that question before but what would you say in a nutshell to people who have, like, it's just baffling to them to think, why don't I see Emma Thorne stealing stuff? Why don't I see Emma Thorne doing whatever she wants, thinking that I've got no punishment, no ultimate day in court with the divine? Like, if there's no one looking over your shoulder saying, I'm watching you and I will judge you, there will be a day of reckoning. Why not just do what the hell you want and get whatever you want, be as selfish as you can? Like, if you claim immorality, where does it come from? Or what, it, if that question's wrong, you know, phrase the question how you want it, but how do you live your life with some kind of morality? I think the difficulty of the morality question, which yes, I get all the time. And I see uh, a lot of people, I think just because when you're raised with um, the Bible, say, as the ultimate moral authority, I can see that being like a confusing thing. And I think the problem is that it's not something you can just answer in like a sentence, like, oh, my morality comes from because I think that I do believe that morality is secular. I say that quite often. And I think that that's uh, demonstrable through history. I think that to understand morality requires looking at how ideologies have changed throughout human history, which is like quite a big ask for, you know, a relatively like seems like a simple question. But 
it, it just it, it doesn't take long to look back and say what did we think was perfectly morally acceptable what did you know the good average people of you know 200 years ago think was completely morally fine that we completely disagree with now and that maybe you know the bible doesn't say anything about or it's not very clear on but we still have those moral convictions anyway you know um yeah. and it's there's a lot of I get a lot of you know God in put our um, morality on our hearts when we were born and that's just we believe what is right and wrong everybody agrees that murder is wrong but then you get okay well there, there's there's righteous killing and wars and and sometimes sometimes it's fine and sometimes God says it's fine and sometimes he doesn't if you just if you just take it at face value as like historical I think it's I think that's the the simplest way because it's very easy if especially if you're like a bit more of a, a sort of modern liberal person if you say right there was a time uh I mean, it depends on your culture as well but there was a time in the UK when uh being gay was morally reprehensible and punishable by law and across the board the average person thought that it was bad and even if they weren't bad people that was just the moral standard of the time why has that changed how did that change was it a gradual change you know what shifted that and if how does that jive with the idea of morality being a, a solid set of ideals that comes from god why did that change were those were all the people of that time wrong and bad are we bad now how how does that work um because i think morality like cultural morality is just something that shifts there's you know you could go over to certain other countries you were talking about north korea earlier there's probably a, a very different feeling on what is moral there than what is moral here that doesn't mean that those people are bad it just means they've been brought up with a different culture um so yeah you don't you don't even have to go back in history to to study it um but yeah i think the fact that it, it does require a bit of research to sort of understand where morality comes from how it adapts um i think I think that tends to make that discussion a bit difficult and puts people off and is possibly why it's kind of almost easier to be like, see, they have no morals or, or oh, you do get your morals from God. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it, it doesn't take much work to identify where your, you know, certain morals come. Maybe it's something you were taught when you were young or, you know, this, uh, this changed in the 1950s or it's, it takes, it takes a little bit of work. But I think when you start researching, it becomes very clear that morality is not like a, a solid, you know, it's not Ten Commandments. It's not like a, a book of instructions. It's something that evolves as we evolve as people and our you know, needs as a species change. Um, so that was a very long and complicated answer. <laughs> That's a good answer. I like that. It, I think what's interesting, too, just to give a maybe a negative answer of what it's not, I think it's been interesting to, to realize just to be really honest with the Bible's morality and to say, if, if we're going to claim that this book is so wonderful and so moral, then we, we really have a problem. And I know we touched on it earlier, so I don't want to beat this horse to death, but or whatever they, that phrase is. But when you, when you look at it, you're talking about a book that it easily commands and, and supports things like genocide, land theft, slavery, child brides, or worse, um, stoning, um, advanced misogyny and patriarchy, uh, all kinds of kind of uh, forms of, I don't want to say racism, but, um, you know, tribalism where, you know, we're, we're going to be the best, where you are the best, we're the final word. And if you don't agree with us, we're going to kill you all. Um, the stoning issue, you know, if you don't agree with our morality of, of picking up sticks on the Sabbath, then we're going to stone you to death. Um, mm -hmm. Stoning your girls for having sex us out of marriage, um, there's a passage that gives a prescription for how to induce a, an abortion in a woman if you think she's been possibly unfaithful, the baby that she's carrying isn't yours. It's like a magic dust water potion from the dust of the temple. Um, you know, people that are identified as righteous, like Lot, uh, if you remember that character, Lot, he oh, offered yeah. his daughters to a group of rapists. And then later when they all were destroyed, um, Sodom and Gomorrah, he, on two separate nights, had uh, sex with his daughters and impregnated them. Um, he's called a righteous man. And, you know, King David, bizarre, bizarre stuff with him. 
And he's, you know, the psalmist. He's the one who wrote all these songs, supposedly, and praising God. And people people lift up people that, like, I think if, if there was a King David today and he did the things he did, Christians across the board would say, put that man in prison, lock the key for life, what he did. What Lot did put him in prison. He is a horrible man. And yet people sing King David's songs today. They praise Lot's righteousness as it talks about in I think it's Hebrews or James. And it's like the morality of the Bible, if, if, if we want to say even something like, I'm not sure where morality comes from. It's, it's culturally evolved, but it's a big question mark. But if, what we can say is where it doesn't come from. And I think that's where a, a lot of people need to st- at least start from and say, mm-hmm. if you want to claim a morality or not, but don't claim it from the Bible because that book is nasty. And I think to it, this is a topic that comes up a lot. But when you look at the Yahweh character, the way that he basically says, I love you, but if you don't love me back, I'll destroy you in a very, very horrific sense. That's a psychopath. You know, if, if, a, if, a, if a man did that to his wife, she would easily have reason to call the police and to separate herself from that situation. You would never want a real person to do what he does. And, and yet people praise him. And I think that's, it's bizarre to me when you escape that, that we who were in it did not see it. It's like, why did I praise this guy? Why did I call him? I don't know if you remember singing songs about this, but songs about him being a good father. Like, why would I call him a good yeah. father? A good father who would burn his own children forever? That's not a good father. Um, it yeah. talks about they asked for, the Israelites asked for bread and water, and he gave it to them and immediately sent vipers to, to kill them all. Like, that's not a good father. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's surprising to me that Christians can't see that. Do you ever kind of steer the conversation that way at all? Or? Yeah, I tried. I, I tried very recently. I got um, a letter. Our local Jehovah's Witnesses aren't uh, witnessing in person at the moment because of um, the pandemic stuff. So we got a letter through from um, from the local Kingdom Hall. And I was like, OK, interesting. And it came with a pamphlet, you know, about um, whatever the, the hot topic of the day is. And at the moment, it's suffering. Um, and uh, the idea of it was, is God the cause of the suffering? And they said no, because the Bible says God is incapable of wickedness. So I I sent off a quick email back and I was like, hey, um, this is really interesting. Thank you very much for your nice letter. Here are some examples of things that I would consider really wicked that God did, commanded, uh, praised people for. Love to know what you think. Um, And I never heard back. I'm very disappointed about it. But I do try. And I think it's just it's it is really hard when you look at it from an outside perspective, because like when you talk about morality, if you look at the Bible as like a historical document, it makes perfect sense. And it's an interesting track of how morality has changed over time, you know, and in certain groups, but looking at trying to look at it as the ultimate morality and, and trying to look at that as a, an all loving God who, who loves all his creations and, and cannot be wicked. You just can't, you can't pass that with, with, modern morality it just doesn't it doesn't work and i i haven't managed to hear or come across a convincing argument yet for how you know people have ways of working around like biblical slavery and things like that but it's very i i've never had it explained how this god can you know all of these things truly are good you know without it being like you know a a non-literalist approach which is like maybe that was misinterpreted or you know written differently um yeah so I I try to have those discussions where I can sometimes I just don't sometimes I just don't hear back I get disappointed because you know you get people that are like oh yeah reach out to us any questions any discussion and you're like missionaries brilliant they they'll keep knocking even if you tell them not to like this is great I can have this discussion and then nothing and I get you know emails saying I've got um I I know God is real and I can prove it to you and I'm like fantastic please please show me and then just I never I never seem to get any replies I would love to have those conversations more because it's something that just I just I can't conceive of how you can understand all loving ultimately moral God and the Bible being accurate because to me it just it cannot be yeah it's I I love that they don't respond it's funny it's it's funny I've had I've invited a lot of preachers on to my channel and most of them won't come on which is not surprising but i'm like well don't you want a chance to defend your faith against us horrible atheists and 
mm. pretty much just across the board they they say no no thank you but it um it it does beg the question of like if you really believe that your book is as Spurgeon a preacher named Spurgeon would have said you know like a roaring lion just let him let him out let the let the lion speak his word the word of god is powerful why don't you just preach the word and let it get out and they just they kind of wither away and it one of the interesting dynamics with that <clears throat> to me is when people are trying to defend this stuff and this is going to sound a little bit snarky and i don't i don't i try not to be too snarky <laughs> but um i almost like them to keep talking like what i mean is when, when an apologist when you say to an apologist a christian apologist can you please defend slavery Mm -hmm. And they start talking, they begin to sound very cringy. They begin to sound like they're trying to say that certain lives aren't worth as much as others. Mm -hmm. And I almost am like, you know what? I think I'd like you to keep talking and say some more. Not because I agree with them or want them to have a platform, but because I think you're digging the hole deeper. Like, keep talking. And I've people have asked me, like, why do you occasionally have Christians on your channel? And part of me is I'm truly questioning, like, what? Do they believe what's their story mm -hmm. but part of me is is like i want i want the other not as much atheists but i want the christians that might listen who are on the fence who would say oh it's an atheist but is a christian that's someone that can defend me someone that can tell my side of the story i want to hear what the christian has to say and so i give the christian a slight platform and they look so stupid every time they just look like they're they're defending patriarchy or they're defending um, slavery and other things. And I'm like, and I'm, I'm not ever going to turn my channel into something where I invite a lot of Christians on, but when I do, it's specifically to show people like, let's put the cards on the table. No more surreptitious, you know, sleight of hand. Let's just ask the hard questions. Why is there slavery in the Bible? Period. Why is there stoning? Why is that? Why are they stoning homosexuals and people who had sex outside of marriage? Why are they stoning children who are disobedient to their parents? Um, why are all these things happening? You know, why, why are people stealing people's land that have been there for thousands of years? And the more that they defend it, I think, and I might be wrong, but I think there's a chance that the, the Christians who are watching, who are asking some honest questions would say, you know what? Is this really the best that my side can do? Because <laughs> if this mm -hmm. is the best that my side can do, we're not doing so good. And I think it just, there's a part of me, and I apologize if it sounds snarky. I, I, tr I really try not to be too snarky. I, I know it's there's times, but I, I don't want to become a snark personality. But it's like it it does. Does that you know what I mean by that? Does yeah, that absolutely. Yeah, I think yeah, because like I said, I I don't think there are good answers to those questions, and it it benefits us to ask them because it it points out a, a sort of a, a gap in the explanation, you know, um, which you can do with with science in many ways if you're talking about like you know, um, literalism in, in Genesis and, and we can go on about science. But when it comes to the moral questions, I think it's it's a better way to reach people because most, like you say, most Christians who watch that will be like, is this really, is this what we've got? Is that our answer to, to why the Bible says these horrible things? And that, I think that can make people think a lot more than, you know, just the sort of more dry facts. Yeah. yeah. And it, it really, I think, paints a better picture, too, of what a biblical worldview is, where people might say, what does it mean to be a Christian? Oh, I just believe God is love and he wants to save us from our sins and bring us to a wonderful place called heaven. You, if that's all you want to say about it, then that can kind of sound good. You know, there's implications of that. But if you just take it to face value and don't dig too deep, oh, God loves me. He doesn't want bad things for me. He wants good things for me. He wants to heal all my wounds. He wants to take away my tears and give me beautiful things. And and um show me what life's truly supposed to be about a relationship with him good beautiful but then you're like well, well let's just you're, you're missing a few points here and then you say if you want to believe this worldview your god defends all the things we talked about you know slavery genocide land theft um stoning and so you have to take them together and say if if i believe in yahweh then i believe in slavery if i believe in yahweh i believe in genocide you can't have one without the other um and mm -hmm. if you try to wiggle it around or you're just you're basically undermining the tax you're eventually saying here's you know ten thousand bible verses i'll take one of those it's like being at mcdonald's i'll take one of those two of those and three of those and that's it and you're like you, once yeah. you start doing that you made up your own religion that's not biblical morality 
Um, anyway, okay. enough about that. I wanted to ask you one final question. And then if, if you want to maybe um, after that, just any final questions I didn't ask you want to talk about, but feminism and patriarchy is, is my final question for you. Mm-hmm. When you were in Christianity, did you sense that you were seeing patriarchy, you know, in terms of the way that the church worked and, and family worked? And now that you have, in my words, escaped and you have come to a different perspective, what is the value of, of feminism in our world? Do you, I would assume you'd call yourself a feminist, but what, what would you say is your, your heart and your passion for um, true equality? For, for people and also for, for empowerment of people that otherwise maybe in past generations wouldn't have had power. Um, just how do you approach the whole topic and, 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 and also in terms of the, the fight, you know, fighting against patriarchy? How do you do that? And what's your plan of attack in terms of your topics for, for getting involved in that? Sure. Well, I think I was very, I was very lucky because uh, when, when I sort of believed as it were, I, I was very young. Um, and at the time I was being raised by my mum as a single mum. So I saw, you know, every day an independent woman who worked and uh, was, you know, amazing and fantastic. And there wasn't that hierarchical family structure. Um, so very early on, I, I saw the the kind of, you know, I saw equality around me and more or less, um, you know, we had male f- teachers and female teachers and this and that. It was all very nice. Um, I only started to see the sort of other flip side of that as I got older and got exposed to more communities and the news and and sort of realized um, even like it changed my opinion being an adult and working in like a te- technology driven field and how male dominated that is and sort of like okay so what what is actually the problem um and i get a, a lot of people react very badly to even the word patriarchy um and don't believe in it and and think that you're crazy for saying it exists and and i kind of feel like well it just means that the majority of people with power are, are, are men and you know here it's specifically like older white men hold the majority of power that's that's just a, a fact like whatever you know whatever you think about that good or bad or it's it is a real thing that exists um and i i really i have so i talk about certain fundamentalists as well like a lot that target specifically younger people and especially younger women because there are really groups that are going in and trying to mold young women into seeking and and thinking that patriarchy is is the ideal from like a young age and um it's 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 strange and conflicting to see women try to convince like young girls that serving a man is the best thing that you could do and um you know all the decisions that the men make are the ones that you should uh you know defer to because they're the best and it's all great um and i just I just want to I want to challenge that as much as possible and it's it's difficult to do in a way that doesn't as if even if you say feminism if you say patriarchy it alienates people and I think there's an element of some say men feel um a bit unfairly attacked they've never done anything wrong people talking about men doing this men doing that which I understand and it's finding that balance where you're saying okay well this is the this is the extreme end of what's going on and this is the the facts and the reality and and trying to like ground everything in that and saying look these these ideas that um say these preachers are are putting out are 2000 years old and at the time that was morally acceptable and now we understand that men and women have the same thinking capacities people of different race have the same brains and it's not right to because most people on a fundamental level don't think it's right to uh you know disparage who can do what by race sex whatever um and it's just it's just trying to like boil it down to the the basics and say okay here is something that's being taught that contradicts that sort of fundamental equality that we mostly are striving for what can we do about it? Um, and I think a lot of it is just challenging misinformation. 
uh, supporting supporting charities trying to it's because like I say at work changed it for me as well you know being involved in like social equity at work and just trying to figure out how that kind of patriarchy has affected everything from the ground up you know culturally because you've got okay well less women are in you know technology fields why is that well it's because of uh, less opportunities and less interest and why is there less interest oh it's because um it's it's like a capitalism thing it's like a marketing thing where different things are gendered and and it's it's like so big and complex and like off-putting and difficult to talk about um so I just like I just try to pare it down to sort of the basics of like what is I think that's that's a lot of what I do is but it's like yeah what 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 is the thing that here what is it fundamentally saying if it's saying that women should have less than then we can all agree that's bad right so what do we do about it and trying to make it trying to make it more appealing for people who are you know tired of hearing about feminism or or whatever because I think I, I kind of understand where people are coming from with that but at the same time until until there is equality while well, there is inequality in the world we are going to have to keep banging on about it and that's uh that's the only way and it does go, really go hand in hand with that kind of fundamentalism um and you know evangelical preachings they they really perpetuate and again it's it's because of patriarchy it's because the people who largely benefit tend to be white and male and older and and it's like trying to convince people of that. I think it's much harder because then suddenly faith is involved and your your belief in your loving God and his word. And that's like way bigger a challenge. Um, but yeah, I just I just want to keep hammering away. <laughs> and I know, yeah, I know people are getting tired of it, but I just think I just think on a basic level, almost all of us, I know not not everyone but almost everyone I think does want equality and like just trying to reach everyone on that sort of fundamental basic level is kind of the approach that I'm I'm going for and hoping that it it helps that's awesome if I was just going to comment a couple of things to it it's interesting that people can't seem to see any concern about how God is pretty much from the way that you know, we've the the Christian religion that we have uh, received, it's mostly described as a masculine divinity. Like um, just the idea if I think a lot of Christians would be even offended if you said, even women would be offended if you said God is a woman or or some aspect of the Godhead is, is female. You would say God mm -hmm. might be feminine in the sense that he wants to nurture you like a, woman, a you know, mother might nurture a baby, but in the sense of actually saying God is truly feminine in his nature, they'd be like, no, no, God is masculine in his nature. And the idea too, that this, the picture of the Godhead in Christianity is described kind of like a family where there's a father and a son. It's like, well, if you're going to go to the route of saying there's a father and a son, then there should be a mother, right? Because that's where the son comes from. And yet mm -hmm. they just, they don't put those together, even though other religions certainly do. A lot of religions do. Um, they have a, 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 you know, a mother figure, but the idea too of seeing that that was actually there before with ancient Judaism, where, you know, there was Asherah, she was in place as the mother figure. And mm -hmm. you see it woven in where the, the you know, goddess Ishtar in, in, in Proverbs, she's described as, as the goddess of, of wisdom, just going throughout the streets and, and talking. But there are, there are aspects of that where, where it's kind of like hinted at and it got kind of hush hushed. But a lot of early Christians believed that the Holy Spirit was was more feminine was was and it was just you know Holy Spirit was described as a, as a female, and it's like that mm -hmm. makes more sense to say there's a father there's a mother and there's a son, and yet at this point most Christians would be like no no there's there's no way that there's any femininity in the in the official Godhead, and I think you're right that there's there's a lot of stuff where people are still doing this I I don't know honestly, pardon my ignorance but I don't know how much of it is going on in England but I know in America. It is alive and well. And I just want to give one quick example of something I recently saw. There's a group out in the state of Idaho. Um, it's called, the church is called Christ Church. The pastor is named Doug Wilson. I've talked about him before many times. And um, his the school that he runs is called New St. Andrews. And a lot of people there, I mean, they, they are openly 
into Dominion theology. They say, we are here to take over the city, which is called Moscow, Idaho. We're here to take over Moscow for Christ. And eventually they do want to take over the world for Christ. And their patriarchy is through the roof. I mean, they're well known for it to the point that if a woman doesn't wash the dishes when she's told to by her husband, there are cases where the men will literally take her before the elder board for discipline. Um, wow. And they, he has a publishing company called Canon Press. It's his kind of his family publishing company, but they just published somebody's book called, get this, It's Good to Be a Man. <laughs> and they're, they're basically saying, if you are a man and you are not into patriarchy and supporting it, you're basically a, a weakling. You're basically a wuss. Um, mm-hmm. And even to their culture, subculture, if you didn't have a beard, like if a man doesn't have a beard, he's probably already kind of questionable. You know, you should look like a man. You should act like a man. You should talk like a man. Lead like a man and take over. Take over for Christ. This is, this is a war. We're not looking for weaklings. Be a man. Man up. And there are, the, the crazy thing is, I think this is getting back to what you said, they're grooming women to believe that that is in fact biblical and good. And so these young girls will grow up thinking, I don't want to marry and mate with a man unless he is into ultra patriarchy. I want a man who will take over my world and lead our family with strength and belligerence. And it's, it's growing. I mean, people are flocking to that city to be part of that church. And I'm mm-hmm. sure there's many other groups and you probably heard of um, Mars Hill, the church Mars Hill with um, that pastor who was very much into ultra patriarchy. I forget his name, but it's, there's a lot of churches and they're, you'd think these churches must be dying and they're not, they're growing like crazy. And it is very scary mm-hmm. to think about if they keep growing and, and they're going to keep spreading to other cities, you're going to have this, these people all over the place who want to take over the world for Christ. And it, it makes me sad that you think of anyone who would want to stand up, I would think and say enough is enough. It'd be the women who would say, I feel so um, unempowered. I feel so demeaned by what you guys are doing. And yet they don't. And it's it's one of the most surprising things to me as an atheist is to really dig into this and research and realize women in these cults are so brainwashed that they want this, they want the patriarchy to continue. They want to continue to be subservient. They want to continue to be put down. They want to be mm-hmm. continue to be an addendum to a man's life. The man is the story. She is just the subtext. And it breaks my heart because <clears throat> when you train young girls to believe in that, that that's what they want. And it's just, it's going to perpetuate. And as a funny side note, those kind of people tend to want to outbreed the pagans. So they're the people that are going to have 10 kids, which is another reason they're going to, they're going to outvote, outvote us. They're going to outvote us because mm-hmm. there's just going to be more of them than, than there are of us. So that's why it's so critical, I think, for us to be in this fight. Anyway, I know it was a bit of a Definitely. rabbit trail, but I appreciate you Let me share that. Of course. Those are my questions. I wanted to give you the floor to wrap us up. Did you have any final thoughts or any questions that I might not have asked that you wanted to um, put out there to close us out? Um, I don't think so. I think, uh, yeah, I think what you're doing is really fabulous. And uh, I'm... I'm excited to keep up the fight. It it does sound sometimes when we talk about all the the negativity, it does sound like a bit draining. But I think it's important to know that uh, you know when when you are affecting like anybody's life in a positive way, even if it's like one person, that's like so much good, um, and and so much good comes from these conversations. And even just even just thinking about it, whether you're a religious person or an atheist, even just having these listening to these conversations and just thinking on what does it mean what can I do to help what is what is best for people and for me I think that's that's all so so good and does so much good um so yeah thank you for what you do and uh and keep at it yeah likewise well thank you so much too it's been great to get to hear your story you definitely have a little different story than some of the people I've, I've heard I'm so glad that you you were able to be spared some of the worst parts of that growing up um, yeah. But thank you for what you're doing too. And please keep up the fight and um, please send Kent Hoven our very best. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> I, I, love, I love what you're doing with him. Um, well, maybe I was going to say, if we ever do a follow-up, I'd love to do talk about creationism with you in more detail and, and kind of w- just what your part in all that is. But that's another aspect. We could, you know, take an hour on that probably, but that's a big fight too, is, is people really, really believe that the earth is really young and they believe mm-hmm. we did not evolve 
And um, usually the other flip side of that is they believe that the earth is about to come to a fiery conclusion when the Lord returns. And that, you know, it sounds like it's just mythology, but it affects whether or not you support climate or, or fighting climate change. It affects your decisions. So there's a lot of stuff there we could unpack. But uh, anyway, tongue in cheek, thank you for what you're doing for Kent Hovind. Um, I think it's awesome that you're bantering with him. Um, mm -hmm. But um, thank you too for your channel. Everyone, we've been again speak, been speaking with Emma Thorne. Please go to her channel, like, and subscribe. Emma, thank you again. Please keep up the fight and uh, we'll talk again. Thank you. Thanks so much.